So we've introduced the idea of supply and demand. In this chapter, we're going to zoom in a little bit on the demand side and take a look at why consumers do what they do. So we have a review here of some of the things we've introduced before. Remember, rationality, we're saying that people are making choices in their own self-interest, using all their available information to make themselves as well off as possible. So that'll be, that's our rationality assumption. We also introduced that idea of scarcity before and trade-offs. That shows up here in our budget constraint. So with a limited amount of income available, how do consumers spend their money on goods and services? We're introducing here this idea of utility. With utility, just think satisfaction or enjoyment. It's not something that we can actually physically measure, but it's a conceptual tool that we're going to use throughout this. A big distinction here is going to be the difference between total utility and marginal utility. This should become clearer in the next slides. Uh, remember, with marginal, we are thinking additional. The additional utility you are going to get from consuming, say, another slice of pizza. And we expect that the first items you consume, that first slice of pizza, the second slice of pizza, those are going to give the most marginal utility. And then after that, the subsequent items are going to give less and less additional utility each time you consume, right? So by the, you know, the fifth pizza pizza, that's really not adding very much to your total utility. So that would be a small marginal utility. That idea is encompassed here in this law of diminishing marginal utility that consumers experience diminishing additional satisfaction as they consume more of a good or service. So continuing with the pizza example, imagine that you eat zero slices of pizza, your total utility would be zero. And then these here are these numbers, remember, they don't really mean anything uh, except they are a representation of your total satisfaction, your total enjoyment, your total utility. The units on these things, we, we call them utils. So that's just happiness, higher is better. Okay, so your first slice uh, you, gives you 20 utils. Your second slice, the total number of utility you get from two slices is 36 utils. With your third slice, the total number of utility you get from three slices is 46 utils. So here is a graph of total utility, right? It's increasing, but see this rate at which it's increasing is falling, right? The slope is getting flatter as we go, and eventually it bottoms out a slope of zero around here, and then eventually de uh, becomes negative. So this that uh, decrease in the slope would be the diminishing marginal utility that we were talking about. So if we wanted to straight up look at marginal utility, it would just be how much an additional slice gives you, right? So that first slice adds 20. The second slice, this difference here, is 16. So the second slice adds 16. The third slice, this difference, is 10. That's how you're going to get marginal utility. And if we wanted to graph that, here's the marginal utility of each of these slices of pizza. So here it's very easy to see that we do, in fact, have diminishing marginal utility. So remember, the problem that we're trying to solve here is to maximize total utility subject to a budget constraint. And we're going to do that by equalizing marginal utility per dollar spent. So let me go back to this last slide to give you an example here. So imagine you have $5 to spend. So we've calculated marginal utility for both of these, and now we've also, we say pizza costs $2 a slice and Coke $1 per cup. So we've divided marginal utility by those prices. With our first dollar, you have $1 to spend. You have, this gives you 20 utils per dollar versus 10 utils per dollar. So your first dollar goes here at 20, because 20 is bigger than 10. Your second dollar, now you've you have one cup of Coke, so you look at the second cup of Coke. 15 utils per dollar versus 10 utils per dollar. So we go again here, 15. Our third dollar, we have 10 utils per dollar here versus 10 utils per dollar here. So it doesn't matter either way. We've spent $2. So let's just say we go here with another cup of Coke. So now we've spent $3. We have $2 left. We have three cups of Coke. So the next one would give us five utils per dollar versus 10 utils per dollar over here with pizza. So this time 10 is bigger than 5, so we go with a slice of pizza. Now remember here that pizza costs $2 per slice. We've spent 3 here on Coke, and now if we go here, we spend our last $2. So that means we spent, we've exhausted our budget, and we are choosing to consume 3 cups of Coke and 1 slice of pizza. So that's what's going on here in this chart. What I just did was with 5, uh, sorry, with uh, the price of $5, uh, we, our goal is to maximize or 
to maximize total utility subject to a bu budget constraint is to equalize marginal utility per dollar spent. So that happened at 10, right, on this last slide, 10 and 10. That's what shows here. And that is this, that is this example here. So our total spending was that $5, that was our budget constraint, and that gives us a total utility of 65. If you have a different budget constraint, you're going to get different results, uh, different uh, total consumption, right, and different total utility. So if the marginal utility per dollar attained from pizza was greater than that obtained from Coke, that means there's more bang for your buck with pizza. You should consume more pizza and drink less Coke. So to maximize total utility subject to a budget constraint, we're going to follow this rule of equal margin utility per dollar spent to equalize the bang for your buck that the consumer is going to get. So like I said, there are different combinations depending on the budget constraint. So actual, the actual what you actually purchase does depend on your budget constraint. The way, one I went through was with $5. You should go through with $10 and make sure you get these same examples here. In each case, you're going to exhaust your budget because spending additional money gives you more utility. So here's, here's in summary, this is what we're doing. To maximize utility subject to a budget constraint, satisfy the rule of equal margin utility per dollar spent. You need to calculate the margin utility for pizza, the margin utility for Coke, and then divide those by the, the price for pizza and then the price for Coke. When this hap happens, that means that you are gonna maximize utility. You're also gonna exhaust your budget so that your total spending on pizza plus your total spending on Coke equals your budget. It could be the case that you only drink Coke or that you only eat pizza. That, that's fine, it's just gonna depend on the numbers that you get. Okay, so what happens if we disobey this rule? Remember, that the whole idea of this rule is we're maximizing total utility subject to the budget constraint. So if you do something different than this, you're not gonna maximize your total utility. So you're going to end up in a situation where your margin utility per dollar from Coke um, is a lot greater than your margin utility from, a do from margin utility per dollar of pizza. And so you should be drinking more Coke and eating less pizza. If you did that, that would increase utility. So the whole idea of this, of this rule, in quotations, is to maximize total utility subject to a budget constraint. If prices change, your calculation is going to change. So you're going to have to go through, still, it still should be the same margin utility, but you're going to have to divide by that new price for, say, if pizza changes, the new price for pizza. So this is going to affect your calculation in two ways. You can afford, if the price falls a pizza, on the one hand, you can afford to buy more than before. It's like having a higher income because now the price of pizza is cheaper. And at the same time, pizza is cheaper compared to Coke now. So this first one we call the income effect, and the second one we call the substitution effect. So the income effect is just the change in quantity demanded of a good that results from the effect of a change in price on consumer purchasing power, holding other factors constant. So this is like it increases your purchasing power when the price of pizza falls. The effect, the income effect, the actual result depends on whether the good is normal, goods that we consume more of as our income rises, or inferior goods that we consume less of as our income rises. So if pizza is a normal good, its price falls, then we're going to consume more pizza. But if pizza is inferior, the income effect will decrease, causing you to consume less pizza. So is pizza a normal or inferior good for you? What do you think? The substitution effect is just that change in the relative prices. So if the price of pizza falls, it becomes less expensive compared to other goods. So we'll expect that consumers would substitute towards pizza because the pr because its price is now cheaper relative to Coke. So the opportunity cost of consuming a slice of pizza falls, so we would expect you to eat more pizza. So here is a summary of the income and substitution effect. You need to be very familiar with this, be able to work through the, the logic here of why this makes sense. So here's the example of the price of pizza falling to $1.50 per slice. You should work through this, it's just like what we did before. Now assume that you have a $10 budget and figure out what would be the optimal consumption bundle? How much pizza and Coke should you consume given a $10 budget? Remembering the uh, equalizing the margin utility per dollar spent. So we've zoomed in on the consumer and we're doing this in part to tie back to the idea of demand and supply that we introduced before. So remember the law of demand is just that downward relationship between price and quantity demanded. When the price falls, the quantity demanded increases. And we can see why that happens for an individual now by looking at the income and substitution effects. 
So the substitution effect says that as the product becomes relatively cheaper, um, if the price of it falls, consumers are going to substitute towards that good. That's a substitution effect. As the price falls, it also basically means our purchasing power is increased. So our income is effectively higher. So if the good is a normal good, we're going to consume more of it. So this is just coming from the analysis that we did before. When pizza was at $2 per slice, I think this is based on a $10 budget, uh, that example that we looked at before, our consumption was three, uh, was three units. When the price falls to $1.50, we're down here at four. So this is just based on that marginal analysis that we did before, equalizing uh, marginal utility per dollar spent. And what this does, if we could um, consume incremental goods, right, so like partial slices of pizza between here and less than three as well, that would just fill in these uh, all these dots in between and make these lines. And this would be the individual's demand curve for pizza. It is a downward sloping line, just like we would expect. Um, as price falls, our quantity demanded increases. To get to market demand, we sum up the individual demand curves. And the way you do this, pay careful attention here, is you're going to look at a specific price for this individual. At 150, the quantity was 4. For the, this other individual, at 150, the quantity is 6. So for the market demand, if these two individuals are the whole, oh, sorry, I have another individual here. At 150, this is 5. So we need to add up the 5, the 6, and the 4 to get 15. That is market demand. We do that for each price, coming across each price, adding up the quantity at each price for each individual to get the market demand curve. So here we go. At 150, that's that 15. So you do that coming across horizontally, getting the quantity at each price, and that is your market demand.